So let's talk to our panellists today, Andy Williams and Stephen Wolf. Andy is a political commentator. Stephen is a migration expert, former MEP and director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity. Stephen, maybe I'll start with you actually on what we're going to talk to um, Neil O'Brien about a little bit later on in the programme. He's a former public health minister, the Conservative MP for Harborough, uh, Odeby and Wigston, and he says that migrants should be tested for HIV coming into the country. When I went to America, I've mentioned this earlier in the programme, for a year I did a, did a master's degree agree there. Uh, I had to have a, a, um, a, an x-ray for TB to make sure I didn't have TB and all sorts of other uh, medical tests and so on. This, is, this strikes me as pretty reasonable. What do you think? Uh, good evening, Peter. Good evening, Mike. Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think it is one of those most sensible things that we should do. What we do know about the process of, of when people come across, across on the channel or indeed if they're caught coming across in, in the backs of lorries is that in the assessment process that's often done, it is, uh, there is a medical check. But what is unfortunately not always done is the case is they don't always check for TB and they don't always check for uh, other illnesses or diseases. It's just a basic check that they do. And bearing in mind that just during the period of COVID, I, I, I released a freedom of information request that showed a letter that went to all the NHS chiefs showing that those people coming across from Afghanistan, those coming from Iran and Iraq, had huge cases of TB and other uh, communicable diseases, it would make absolute sense to assess them for those when they arrive, purely for two reasons. One, for their own protection, so that we know exactly what's going on, but secondly, for the protection of the community. Uh, it's also the case, of course, that we uh, don't appear, or maybe we do, Stephen, actually, you're the expert on it. What about uh, illegal migrants coming across on small boats? Do they get medical checks? Because they don't seem to. I mean, they disappear into the black market often and we don't know where they're going. Oh, no, that's exactly the people that I was talking about, oh, okay. Peter. They okay. are the ones that get that checks. There are checks, but they don't do the full... What, 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 uh, are, the, what are the checks for legal migrants if you come here as a, as a legal migrant? As illegal migrants, it's a bit more difficult. I, I know that we do it in certain countries like the United States, as you pointed out, and this is a little trickier because we 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 have some difficult international laws to try and compl comply with, particularly the agreements that we've made with uh, Europe, for example. So I, I think what you should be doing is looking at the different countries and maybe having a much more focused approach on those countries where we know that there are high disease levels and then make assessments based on that. Andy, uh, tell me what you think about this proposal from Neil O'Brien to test people for HIV when they come into this country. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit torn on this. My instinct is that it's pretty inhumane, not a very good way to um, treat people, particularly legal migrants. I mean, if you're if you're a, if you're it's been legally uh, you know established that you have the right to come and live and work in this country. I don't see why we should be testing you for certain diseases any more than we should. Uh, people who currently live here. Um, why only HIV? Why not? Uh, well, I think, I think that's perhaps in, in addition, and Neil O'Brien is a, is a, will be talking to him a little bit later on in the programme, but mm. I mean, he is a former public health minister. He, he is, and I actually, as former Tory ministers go, quite respect Neil O'Brien, but just because he's a former public health minister doesn't mean he's an expert in public health, with all due respect. Fair enough. Let's move on to the um, NHS, keeping on health matters uh, themselves, Wes Streeting. Actually, do we have that clip of Wes Streeting? Uh, he was on the BBC earlier on today talking about this uh, and the, what the NHS needs in the budget. He says he's happy with the settlement that he has uh, received. Let's just remind ourselves what he's been saying and then I'll ask Stephen and Andy what they think. It's not just about um, cutting waiting lists uh, and improving services, although that is the, the most important fundamental thing. It's also about reforming the system so that we can get more for the money that we put in. Because as people will see tomorrow, we've prioritised the NHS at this budget. That's against the backdrop of some really difficult choices and trade-offs. So we owe it to patients and to taxpayers to make sure that every penny that goes into the NHS is money that is well spent. And, and think... that's why investment must be linked to reform. Wes Streeting there talking uh, earlier on to the BBC. I mean, he's saying that investment must be linked to reform, Andy, but he's also green-lighted, hate that phrase, approved, a huge pay rise for junior doctors. You can argue whether they should have that or not have that. That's not really the point I'm making. The point is that that's been given without any link to reform. So 
he hasn't linked it so far. In the first test that he had to link reform to more money, he hasn't done that in regard to the pay rises. I just wonder whether you think it's realistic to do that in the future, Andy. Well, I think it, I think that absolutely what has to happen. I mean, what, what we definitely can't do is keep shoveling money into the NHS without changing anything. So funding the NHS, giving more money in itself alone is not going to help. In the last 70 years, since 1955, NHS spending has increased by an average of 3.6% in real terms every single year. That is not sustainable. It's not working. The NHS isn't better than it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. It's not. So, it, it, yes, cash. And I think I, I think in terms of the announcements that have been made today, I think it's 1.5 billion of investment in equipment and yeah, uh, and, and which will be presumably part of the 10 billion that the Chancellor will announce tomorrow. We we know so much of what's in the budget so far. Stephen, what's your take on this? Well, I'm glad Andy has actually pointed out that in real terms, the NHS has received uh, huge numbers of percentage increase compared to other budgetary areas. Um, but where I, I, I feel is two particular points that I, I, I will always say, firstly, that the government will not be able to improve the NHS because the, the, of one of the factors. One of the factors is demand. And demand is our population, and our population growth is, is unsustainable at the moment, with the OBR suggesting that we're going to add another 6 million in the next 10 years, just on a basis of an average net migration of 350,000. We know that's nonsense. The average net migration is 500,000. So we're going to have about 7 to 9 million people in 10 years. So consequently, it doesn't matter if we overspend, as West Streeting wants to do, on infrastructure, paying our nurses and doctors more. We can't keep up with that demand unless we deal with the population issue first. And the second point I always always say, and I think Andy's kind of alluded to that, is we have put huge amounts of money in, but we haven't had any real change, any improvements in productivity. And I'm afraid that I think it's just that the NHS is not capable of doing that, and nor are the consultants, the big consultants firms that are brought in to do this either. They just don't have a clue. I've, I've worked in some of the large consultancy firms, and I think more or, the, more or less they're interested in making their hourly rates than they are in actually making good change. Andy, I saw you nodding your head for a number of those points that, uh, that um, Stephen was making. Do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I broadly agree with that. I mean, I would make the slightly facetious but also factual point that uh, net migration has been higher in the last few years as a direct result of Brexit and the Brexit deal that Boris Johnson did. Um, that's just a fact. But, you know, Stephen's, Stephen's right. Obviously, the, we've got growing population, also an ageing population. I think it's incredibly important that this government gets a grip on social care, comes up with a proper strategy for social care, because if we don't do that, then we're completely screwed. And um, the other thing is uh, investment in technology. We have not just AI, but all sorts of other technologies that could massively and rapidly make a difference to the NHS. So it's a combination of things. It might be about more short-term funding. It's investment in technology. It's changing systems and processes. But also, as Stephen says, um, if we're going to have another 9 million people in the next 5 to 10 years, then that in itself is a, is a huge problem. So there has, there's a trade-off there. Uh, Stephen, you were sort of slightly not entirely believing Andy's point there. Perhaps you give, give us your perspective on this. Andy, no, I, mean, I, I understand where Andy's coming from in terms of Brexit. The Brexit element gave a fairness to our society and that's suddenly we treated the whole of the world equally to be able to come here rather than just having a preferential to the EU and I wholly welcome that. The, the, the problem with the, the way that it was dealt with is that Boris Johnson's admitted that he didn't really control uh, legal migration, they opened the doors to it because they were afraid that they wouldn't have enough people to man the vehicles who were doing our deliveries or doing coffees or getting into our shopping centres. And that wasn't necessarily a consequence of Brexit, that was a consequence of a policy that we allowed the government to do. So I, I think it's not entirely something that we can blame on Brexit, we can blame it on the misunderstanding of politicians and policy makers of how the population grows so rapidly when you open the doors and don't control migration in certain aspects of our economy. Well, there's lots more to talk about, including budget speculation and minimum wa wage rise. Uh, West Reading as well, talking about private schools and attacking them for, as he puts it, pleading poverty over the uh, thought that that 
will be added to school fees from January. Uh, we'll come back to Andy and Stephen in just a second after the break. But I just want to read out quite a number, uh, well, not a number, but a couple of messages that people have sent in. Uh, Tanya says Andy Williams said it would be inhumane to test migrants for diseases. We had eradicated diseases such as smallpox, but this has now raided, uh, raised its ugly head due to immigration. Are, are there cases of smallpox in the UK? Uh, we need to protect the citizens of this country from potentially deadly diseases, says Tanya. Clive says, great show as ever, as freebie Starman insists there is no two-tier policing in what's left of the country, and remembering the lady that was locked up for over two years for saying nasty things on social media. Will the same action be given on the, to the Palestinians, chanting hate crimes on the underground? I wonder, though I think we know the answer. Disgraceful, says Clive in Solihull, who uh, ends his uh, message, as he always does when Clive occasionally gets in touch vote reform. Uh, Claire says the British Transport Police said that they're looking into the Free Palestine rant on the train. This is what the police are supposedly doing with the two thugs who attacked our police officers in Manchester Airport. Same old story, same result, nil. Thank you to Daz and Newquay in Cornwall who says, I lived and worked in three Middle Eastern countries uh, between 20 2007 and uh, 2017. Uh, to get my work visa I had to have a full medical, including HIV and a TB test before I got in. Well, Daz, I, I, I basically did the same thing when I went to America. Um, I, I lived there for about a year and a half. I did a master's there and I yeah, got the TB test as well, had to get a chest x-ray, full medical and all the rest of it. And I think that's probably quite reasonable, actually. And it's, it's good to know, actually, if you have any of these diseases because then, of course, you can um, actually tackle them. Right, let's get back to the conversation between Andy Williams and Stephen Wolfe. Uh, Andy is a political commentator. Stephen is a migration expert, former MEP and director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity. Let's talk about economic prosperity. In fact, let's talk about growth because uh, the minimum wage is uh, set to rise by more than 6% in the budget. We've got a lot of different information in regard to what is in the budget tomorrow. We'll have full coverage, of course, here on Talk. I'll be involved in that. Is a 6% rise in the minimum wage a good thing, Stephen? Uh, we, of course, have to see it in the context of the fact that there are lots of pressures on businesses coming in other directions in this budget by the look of things. Well, I think if you look at the individuals receiving the 6%, it's going to be very helpful for them. Without a doubt, anyone who is younger, who receives an uplift in their wages, that's an improvement for them, particularly for many of them who might be living at home or working uh, as students who could do that too. But there are a number of people who are genuinely uh, working who live on their own as well. So that's a, a, a positive for them, you can see that. But where the negative will come in, and this is the real big impact, is for anyone who's watched and understood how the cost of uh, energy has impacted small businesses, be they retail, uh, be they the um, entertainment sector, pubs, wine bars, clubs, for example, they're already struggling heavily. And with the potential, and, and we've got to see that, of, of, of national insurance increases for employers as well, all I can see is that a number of small businesses will start to fold. I think we'll also see... I've already uh, had that. I've already had those messages, Stephen, to be brutally yep. honest. I've had people saying, to, uh, you know, if this goes ahead, I've had people saying, I run a small business, we're not going to pass the prices on to our uh, to our customers because we can't because we've already put them up because of what's happening recently and in the last couple of years. What we're going to have to do is sack staff. Andy, what do you make of all this? Well, obviously, I think it's a good thing that the minimum wage is rising. People at the bottom... Uh, end of the income scale are really, really seriously struggling. Um, I'd also note that when the national minimum wage was introduced back in 97, 98, I think it was, um, the Conservative Party opposed it and consistently said that businesses wouldn't be able to cope and businesses would fold. So this is an argument that has been um, long, long hammered home by the right. However, um, I definitely wouldn't be introducing this at the same time as changes to employer national insurance, um, which I, I I think is the wrong decision to raise employer national insurance. That is quite a significant levy on business. So doing both of these at the same time, I think could be really damaging. Okay. Um, Absolutely. Sorry, go ahead, Stephen. Couldn't, yeah, I couldn't agree more. We've got around a, a four to 5% business rate collapse at the moment, and 34% of businesses are failing in their second year in small businesses. And, and what we've seen is 47,000 or, or so businesses have collapsed uh, are on the edge of it, particularly in construction, particularly in support services and in the real estate. So adding those two together is going to be incredibly damaging. What I find really worrying about this is that, and I've said this for many, many years, is there's this edging of support for corporatism. 
the large multinationals, the Amazons of this world, the DHLs, the, the, all these huge companies that rely on the small competitors being pushed out of the businesses, that ensure that they want to have the staff at lower wages, hence the, their support for large-scale migration. They're the ones who will be able to benefit from this, not the small businesses. And I worry that we're getting bigger and bigger companies and less smaller and smaller companies. Do you think there'll be much carrot in this budget, Andy? Because we've had plenty of stick that has been pre-announced. Uh, no, frankly. Uh, I think there will be some, you know, that is one example of uh, something that hopefully should have a positive impact on some people. But no, by and large, there won't be. Any benefit that people see will be in the medium to long term as a result of investment in services like the NHS. Um, it's not going to be a giveaway budget. It's not going to be pleasant for lots of people. I said to you, I think, when we spoke on Saturday, Peter, that I think Rachel Reeves is in an incredibly difficult and highly constrained uh, position. Mm -hmm. And clearly, she has to uh, clear up some of the absolute mess that was created over the last 15 years. I personally might have made some different choices. One in particular is I feel very strongly that we should be doing more to tax, particularly people with second homes, third homes, fourth homes, fifth homes, landlords. Um, there was a debate the other day about whether or not landlords are working people. To me, my mind, the answer is that some are, but most aren't. And we need to be doing more to tax, I think, unearned wealth. If you own five, six, seven homes, tough. These are the people we should be hitting. Okay. Well, I, I can't agree with I, I certainly can't agree with that, Andy, because I think if you take away this, the 2.2 million small uh, to medium-sized uh, landlords and rent renters in this country, all you'll end up doing, as I've been noticing, is the large insurance companies who are waiting in the wings to be able to buy up these buildings. And that's what we have in Europe. We have huge companies like BNP Paribas that own huge estates, and it's all in their hands. And that's what, that's what worries me about these housing. And if you really, really want to go and help housing in this country, and you really want to be able to go after one particular group, then go after foreign ownership of landlords. Make sure that no foreign entity can own any land in this country. Well, if you that. do that, if you do that, you'll free up hundreds of thousands of houses okay. that are owned by foreign insurance and pension companies. Final word from Andy on this. I agree with that, but I equally think if you're somebody who has a million pound house in London and a million pound house in the Cotswolds, I don't feel too bad about you having to pay a bit more. Thank you both very much, Andy Williams, their political commentator, and Stephen Wolfe, who's a migration expert and former MEP. He's also director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity. I should be very clear at this point that I am a director of a housing company. It's called Home Rate, and uh, I just want to make that absolutely clear, just in case there's any suggestion of any sort of conflict of interest or anything like that.